Batman the Animated Series was responsible for reimagining the backgrounds and motivations of many of Batman's rogues gallery. From characters like Mr. Freeze becoming a heartbroken zombie snowman, to Harvey Dent struggling with mental health issues long before his face was disfigured. But that's not the only contribution that the show made to the legend of Batman. Some of the most prominent and exciting Batman characters of the last 30 years made their debuts in Batman the Animated Series. Characters like Harley Quinn, Rene Montoya, and even the dreaded Condiment King made their first appearance in episodes of that wonderful show. However, there are some original creations that never really seem to catch on in the same way. Boss Biggis, the Sewer King, Kyodai Ken. But there is one obscure original villain that I want to talk about today. She made her debut in the first episode of Batman the Animated Series to air back in 1992. We're going to talk about Red Claw. Red Claw first appeared in The Cat and the Claw Part 1. Although it isn't one of my favourite episodes, I have very vivid memories of watching it as a child, seeing Catwoman climbing up the side of the building. I was genuinely floored. I'd never seen anything like it and was hooked on the show. Incidentally, the director of this episode, Kevin Altieri, told me that they went the extra mile to animate this section, to the point that it actually upset some of the background artists, who had to design and paint the buildings with a whole bunch of windows on them. While I sympathise with their struggle, I think the end result was worth their frustration. The episode introduces us to Red Claw through some expositional dialogue from Commissioner Gordon. Red Claw is one of the world's deadliest terrorists, he tells Batman, and word on the street is that he has come to Gotham to steal something deadly. The problem is, no one knows what the guy looks like, and they're not sure what his target is going to be. Which is quite a conundrum for Batman. The Cat and the Claw is primarily about Catwoman, Selina Kyle, and establishes her as an anti-hero of sorts. She steals from the rich to fund her charitable work with animals. When a site that she had earmarked for a mountain lion sanctuary gets bought out from underneath her by the company Multigon International, Selina decides to use her costumed alternate identity to dig up dirt on Multigon and get the land back. Multigon claims that they're going to take the land and turn it into a resort, but in reality they want access to the abandoned secret military base on the grounds. Multigon seems to be a front for the secretive international terrorist Red Claw. Red Claw emerges from behind a secret door and it's revealed that <gasps> Red Claw's a woman! Red Claw's design is fairly straightforward. She has long dark hair with a white streak in it and wears a red leotard with a black sash around her waist. The most interesting thing about her design is the tattoo in the form of a big cat's paw on her shoulder. This same tattoo can be found on her followers, indicating their dedication to her cause. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but I wouldn't get my employer's logo tattooed on me unless I felt a deep personal connection to the brand. So her followers must be incredibly loyal. Red Claw clearly has a legion of devoted followers that obey her every command. This includes the chairman of Multigon, a man named Stern, who is completely wrapped around her finger. Quite why the chairman of a massive multinational corporation is involved in terrorism is beyond me, although saying that out loud I realise I probably sound a little naive. The writers of BTS made no secret of their disdain of the mega rich, given how many of them were responsible for the creation of supervillains, so terrorism likely is Multigon's business and Red Claw is very clearly in charge. They may present themselves as a hospitality company, but that is likely a front. They make their money from extorting governments and through violence. When Red Claw catches Catwoman pilfering their private documents, all-out war is declared, and Red Claw's forces quickly discover Catwoman's secret identity. Red Claw's men attempt to kill Selina when she's trying to go on a date with Bruce Wayne, which brings them to the attention of Batman. Meanwhile, Red Claw steals a lethal man-made virus from the government and threatens to unleash it on Gotham unless they provide her with $10 billion in gold bullion. That's a lot of gold bars, especially in 1992. Batman and Catwoman team up to take down Red Claw and destroy the deadly virus. While Batman fights fire with fire, quite literally, Catwoman and Red Claw get into a fight. Red Claw is clearly the stronger of the two and is a better fighter, but Catwoman has the mountain lions on her side, and Red Claw is clearly no match for a big cat. Presumably at this point Red Claw is arrested because she isn't seen again until much later on, when Batman the Animated Series rebranded as The Adventures of Batman and Robin. In the episode The Lion and the Unicorn, which mostly revolves around Alfred Pennyworth's past life as a member of Britain's Secret Service, Red Claw and her cronies kidnap Alfred and his former colleague Frederick in order to get the launch codes for nuclear missiles that are being kept in a castle in Scotland. Just from that brief description of the episode, it doesn't sound much like your typical episode of BTS, which was very intentional. Batman is an incredibly versatile hero. He can feel right at home in multiple genres. Horror, science fiction, and thrillers, for instance. Once again, Red Claw threatens a city with destruction, this time London. 
unless she gets five billion pounds. I can't quite remember what the exchange rate was in 1992, but by my very rough calculations based on the cover price of comic books of the time, it looks like her price has gone up. As an Englishman, I think I have a very different reaction to this episode than viewers from other countries. I find the Britishisms to be stereotypical and the depiction of London isn't something that I recognise. Although I do get that this is a world in which we never left the 1940s, so of course it's going to look a bit old fashioned. But my god, I really cringe at some of this episode. I particularly groan at the dialogue of Red Claw's henchmen. There are other annoyances. It takes at least an hour to fly from London to Scotland, so Batman's brief hectic chase with the missile seems a little far-fetched. I didn't get the sense that Batman had been chasing it for almost an hour. It seemed like it only took a few minutes. But then again, Batman's Batwing already defies physics with the way it hovers in mid-air, so I probably shouldn't moan about how fast it flies. And let us not forget that this is a children's adventure cartoon, not a documentary. My moaning aside, this episode is a very clear love letter to James Bond movies. It has a similar premise. A big bad terrorist is going to blow up a place unless they get a whole load of money and the hero has to stop them. Now, I don't really care for James Bond movies, so that's probably another reason why this episode falls flat for me. The real problem I have with Red Claw, though, is her motivations or the lack of them. Almost every other villain in the show felt like a fully fleshed out relatable figure whose motivations we understood. We may not agree with their actions, but we got why they were doing what they were doing. Take the Riddler, for instance. He was clearly wronged by the greedy Daniel Mockridge and was cheated out of his royalties for the hit video game he had created. Edward Nigma tried to sue, but because of his contract, which defined any of his creations as property of the company, he failed. Because of this failure, Nigma adopted the identity of the Riddler to get his revenge on Mockridge. I'm sure we can all sympathise with Nigma's impotent rage, and Mockridge was clearly a detestable leech, but did he deserve to almost be sliced in half by a mechanised Minotaur? Probably not. Well, it's debatable at best. But Red Claw, she's one dimensional. An Eastern European sounding terrorist with a massive following, for some reason. Maybe she's supposed to be Russian, what with her name being Red Claw. Comic book supervillain names tend to be quite on the nose. See also the KG Beast. And I suppose this doubt emphasizes my point. We just don't know. I think another reason why she never really felt fleshed out is because of her creators. Sean, Catherine Derrick and Laren Bright. For those that aren't aware, the early days of Batman the Animated Series were quite tumultuous. There were essentially two factions within the initial creative team. Producers Bruce Timm and Eric Radomski on one side, the side that wanted to push the boundaries and tell stories that were faithful to the comic book source material, and on the other side you had Sean Catherine Derrick and Laren Bright. Writers who were encouraged by some of the executives to make the show more kid-friendly. This is why early on you had some deep, dark and disturbing episodes like Heart of Ice and Feet of Clay. And then you had episodes like The Cat and the Claw and I've Got Batman in My Basement, which were tonally the opposite. They were essentially two different teams trying to make a completely different show from each other. Conflict between the two sides slowed down production to the point that executive producer Gene McCurdy hired Alan Burnett to help steer the ship straight. Fortunately for us, Burnett had the same view as Tim and Radomski, and eventually Derek and Bright moved on. Now, I don't want to suggest that Derek and Bright were bad at their jobs. Some of their episodes, like the Rene Montoya-centric episode POV, are among my favourites. It's just that the show they wanted to make didn't match Tim, Radomski and Burnett's vision. As the co-creators of Red Claw, they were the ones that would have felt ownership of the character and would have been responsible for developing her. I can't say this with any certainty, but I can easily imagine that the remaining writers likely had no interest in touching that character. At least until the adventures of Batman and Robin rebrand when the writers tried to diversify the show. This was the season that gave us the Western episode Showdown, the farcical comedy of Harley's Holiday and the sitcom like Baby Doll. The Lion and the Unicorn was their thrilling adventure story, reminiscent of the Batman comics of the 1970s under Denny O'Neill and, of course, James Bond. If you're going to tell a story about espionage and terrorism, then it makes sense to bring back Red Claw. I just wish she was more than a cookie cutter, villainous foreigner. I like the fact that she calls out sexism, prompting Batman to identify himself as an equal opportunist crime fighter, but I just wish there was more to her. In the tie-in comics, Red Claw was only used once, and even then it was only for two pages in a single issue. In Gotham Adventures 3, she is shown in an in-universe Batman TV show as having put a bomb in a clock tower, and Batman is moments away from being blown up. And that's it. I have to think that the reason Red Claw didn't get used very much is that there wasn't really anyone to champion the character or provide her with motivation beyond wanting money. While other DCAU originals like Harley Quinn and Livewire would make their way to the mainline DC Comics fairly quickly, it would take Red Claw almost 20 years to make the jump. Even Lockup made it to the comics quicker than her. Red Claw first appeared on the final page of 2022's Catwoman 43. However, 
Aside from the look and the name, there are few similarities between the comic book version and the animated version. The comic book Red Claw is an assassin hired by Black Mask to take out Catwoman, but she turns on Black Mask after Catwoman makes it clear that Black Mask is just a sadistic man out to hurt women, and he would pay a man more than he would have paid Red Claw to do the same job. Red Claw double crosses Black Mask, taking his money and letting Catwoman go, before disappearing into the night. Red Claw clearly found Black Mask's sexism distasteful and took it upon herself to teach him an expensive lesson in equality. I suppose that's one thing that I could say about Red Claw. She was designed to challenge people's expectations about what a terrorist could be. It's just that she's painfully generic and I really would love to know what it was about her that commanded the loyalty of so many people, to the point that they were happy to get her logo tattooed on them, effectively branding them as her property. It can't just be the fact that she's pretty, can it? Well. I suppose there are worse reasons to dedicate your life to someone and commit atrocities in their name. Okay, that's it for this week's essay. If you liked the video, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, tell all your friends about me. You know how YouTube works. If you really enjoyed the video and have the means, please consider making use of the thanks button to send a buck or two my way because every little helps. I offer channel memberships for $1.99 a month. This will get you early access to my weekly video essay, priority responses to your comments, members only videos, custom emojis, and an icon on your profile indicating that you're one of my people. Next time, I'm going to continue with the cat theme by looking at a villain from the new Batman adventures that was based on one of Batman's more comical Silver Age supervillains and reimagined as a devilish cult leader. We're going to talk about Thomas Blake, also known as Catman. Hope to see you then.